स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello and welcome to this lecture on representation which is um, a lecture in the second module of our series of lectures um, in uh, the course cultural studies which is being uh, recorded and uh, recorded under the aegis of the national program on technology enhanced learning which is a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We have already covered several lectures in module 1 and we have uh, looked at uh, a few key concepts uh, in module 2 which is, the, which is our current module and we um, will recall that we uh, discussed key concepts like subjectivity, identity we devoted two lectures to what I uh, said is a very important key concept in cultural studies that of ideology and today we are uh, in another topic which again is, um, is again a pivotal or seminal to uh, studying cultural studies and this is uh, the topic uh, called representation. Like the key concept ideology, representation is um, paramount so to speak in an understanding of cultural studies. So, I would be devoting two lectures uh, to, uh, to this topic. Now, as always let us do a recap of what we learned in the last lecture. You will recall that we talked about ideology having um, several definitions and we said that ideology may be seen as a set of ideals, ideas and ideals as received consciousness, as a systematic body of concepts and more importantly as maps of meaning or pointers to the creation of meaning. We also had occasion to look at a quotation from Chris Barker which, which goes like this, today the notion of ideology at best implies the binding and justifying ideas of all social groups and you will recall that we uh, focused on the two words binding and justifying uh, in, that, uh, uh, in, in that the notion of ideology binds people together, brings people together as a collective and they are also uh, ideas uh, uh, the, which are justifying, which justify uh, you know a in themselves why they should be valuable and also binds people together as a community. Then we uh, also looked at Douglas Kellner and Minakshi Durham's um, words wherein they say that the concept of ideology forces readers to perceive that all cultural texts have distinct biases, interests and embedded values. So, herein you recall that they do away with a, you know the notion of neutrality or the notion of some sort of a pristine innocence in the creation of meaning ok. And we are you know an understanding and analysis of the term the key concept ideology enables us to understand that all cultural texts be they literary texts be they other forms of cultural artifacts uh, inhere ok in themselves distinct biases and embedded values and they reproduce the point of view of their producers and often the values of the dominant social group. This is an echo really of what Marx had said if you remember that the ruling ideas of any age are always the ideas of the ruling class. So, and uh, when you look at ideology we find that uh, we find that ideology is uh, one such tool okay, 
or the concept of ideology is one uh, is a tool that enables us to to unearth okay so to speak or to uncover the biases and uh, uh, the interests of uh, of ideas what i will do is in the last uh, you know because we are re doing a recap here in the last lecture there were uh, there were a couple of slides because of the paucity of time i had to leave uh, them out of the last lecture so in this recap i shall be quickly looking at those as well then we looked at althusser and uh, his structural marxism which talks about ideology as uh, uh, as something that you know in within which we are as he says always already subjects okay and uh, where uh, you know uh, we practice as he says the rituals of ideological recognition our subjectivity within the althusserian uh, framework is something that is already present then we looked at an important word called interpolation in uh, althusser's uh, theory where he says that um, uh, that ideology acts or functions in such a way that it recruits subjects among individuals and transforms them. And then he says that there is a hailing, there is a calling out, which may be even something as commonplace as hey you there. So, cultural forms beckon to us, okay? they call us to come and fit ourselves, you know, uh, into, into the always, uh, you, know, you know, already that is available to us in culture. Then uh, we also looked at Gramsci and uh, you know uh, where he where uh, and his important concept of hegemony and uh, where where he you know he, he talks of uh, he he talks about uh, uh, how consent to the prevailing ideology is is um, you know manufactured uh, by people and it need not be always you know a coercive measure okay uh, we so so to speak given to the ideology and we are coerced uh, we are uh, in a in a non violent sort of a way okay so consent is manufactured i left out this particular point which is false consciousness and by you know by marx and i will come back to it by way of this recap uh, this is by Engels actually and I am quickly reading it. Engels argued that ideology is a process accomplished by the so called thinker. Consciously it is true, but with a false consciousness. The real motive forces impelling him remain unknown to him. Okay? Now, this is the connection between ideology uh, as, as false consciousness. Okay? We are of course what he, what he calls so called thinkers, but we think in a false consciousness. Okay? The motives of the dominant class that, that create this or create our thinking are not available to us and hence we always live in a false consciousness. Otherwise, as he says here, otherwise it simply would not be an ideological process. If we are conscious about it, it cannot be ideology. Hence, he or we imagine false or apparent motives. What happens as a result is, it says here, here the realities of exploitation and subordination of the ruled are masked or concealed by the false consciousness of the ruled or the working class themselves. When there is an ideology that beckons to us, okay, in order that we are recruited in Althusserian terms, we are recruited and we are transformed, then and when we give our consent to it in Gramscian terms, okay. what happens is we end up being in a false consciousness as long as we are unaware of the motives of the dominant class that creates the always already for us. Okay. So, I thought it, uh, it fit to bring uh, uh, this point to your notice. Therefore, ideology is falsehood. Then I will end this recap with a quick reference to Rola Barth. Uh, whom you recall we had occasion to meet in our uh, lecture on, uh, on, on structuralism and this is uh, what he says about, about uh, myths in mythologies, his book mythologies and he says here that bourgeois ideology is talking about bourgeois ideology continually transforming the products of history into essential types. This also is a part of the ideology. Okay? Now, um, 
bourgeois uh, uh, come, come further down bourgeois morality will essentially be a weighing operation the senses will be placed in scales of which bourgeois man will remain the motionless beam what bath is drawing attention to is the myths that sort of congeal that that coalesce after repetition of, uh, after several usage uh, these these bourgeois myths are myths that transform us into types that become essential then he says for the very end of myths is to immobilize the world they must suggest and mimic a universal order which has fixated once and for all the hierarchy of of possessions and that down in the last paragraph he says myths are nothing but the ceaseless untiring solicitation this insidious and inflexible demand that all men recognize themselves in the image in this sense the myth or the image is uh, also one of interpolation the image calls out to us to conform ourselves to it okay yet uh, eternal yet bearing a date which was built of them one day as if for all time and then finally we come uh, to uh, you are already acquainted with this person stuart hall uh, on common sense and he also brings in the the uh, you know uh, uh, something that we rely on so much and something we uh, we feel is a given that of common sense and he am quoting from him it is precisely the its spontaneous quality the spontaneous quality of of common sense its transparency its naturalness and its refusal to be made to examine the premises on which it is founded its resistance to change or correction its effect of instant recognition and the closed circle in which it moves which makes common sense and at the same time spontaneous ideological and unconscious the important thing to be noticed here is that uh, is that the very spontaneity of common sense uh, hides uh, from uh, you know hides from us the fact that it is ideological okay so many common sensical things as many critics say are really not sensible okay then further you cannot learn through common sense how things are you can only discover where they fit into the existing scheme of things in this way it's very what he says the taken for grantedness taken for grantedness is which establishes it as a medium in which its own premises and presuppositions are being rendered invisible by its apparent transparency so the the spontaneity of common sense the very taken for grantedness of common sense the apparent transparency of common sense as knowledge is something that hides the ideology behind it so the point made by stuart hall here is that common sense itself is saturated okay and itself is filled with ideology well after the recap we now come to the topic um, uh, which uh, you know the topic of discussion in uh, the current lecture which is representation and i and as i mentioned in the beginning i shall be devoting two lectures to this topic first let's look at the dictionary meaning of representation as given to us by the chambers 20th century dictionary representation is an act or a state or a fact of representing or being represented okay representation stands for that which rep which represents something maybe all images pictures dramatic performances mental images a presentation of a view of facts or arguments it a representation may also be in legal terms a petition or in political terms a petition it can be a remonstrance an expostulation an assumption of succession, succession by an heir uh, it can also refer to a body of representatives so the dictionary meaning of representation is not really what we discuss or what we take for an understanding of the term representation in cultural studies okay in of course these uh, all these are a part of that but there is a definite uh, political shade to the term representation as we employ it in cultural studies now we shall look at one such way and as um, as said in several times uh, chris barker's definition in the sage dictionary of cultural studies comes in handy so i am going to uh, you know in this lecture i'm, I'm going to really uh, 
uh, focus on two persons, two critics. One is Chris Barker and the other is Danny Cavallaro. And in the lecture after this, in the, in the second part of representation, I shall be looking at work done by Stuart Hall and a few other critics. For, for uh, you know, a beginning of, un, beginning where we unpack the term repre, you know, representation, it is, uh, it suffices uh, for us to take up Chris Barker and Danny Cavallaro's work. Now, let us read. A set of processes by which signifying practices appear to stand for or depict another object or present or pra sorry practice in the real world. Now, look at the, lang the, the kind of words that are being used here by Chris Barker. Okay? Representation, he takes from the dictionary meaning, he takes uh, it to mean that representation is a representation okay? or a standing in. Uh, you know, for something else or a standing for something else. We will read this again. Representation refers to a set of processes by which signifying practices appear to stand for okay, or depict another object or practice in the real world. So, there is therefore, uh, you know, there is a difference between an object as it stands or as it is in the real world and the way or the you know the the object or the artifact or the image that as you've seen in the last slide the image or the picture okay or the mental image that we employ you know to stand for that real object so in this itself there you know the the disconnect is already available to us here is already apparent to us here as pointed out by chris barker now let's see what he says further representation is thus an act of symbolism Okay, the you know we are all we all have an idea of what symbolism is. Okay, the use of symbols to stand for something else. Representation is thus an act of symbolism that mirrors an independent object world. However, now he's moving away from the dictionary definition. He says, however, for cultural studies, representation does not simply reflect in symbolic forms things that exist in an independent object world. There is a problematic here, okay, as is indicated by uh, Chris Barker, uh, Barker's words. He says that within the domain of cultural studies, there is no pure reflectionism here. Okay? Representation is not a direct um, uh, you know, reflection uh, in symbolic forms of things that exist in an in independently in and sort of outside world. Okay? Rather, he says, and this is extremely important for our understanding of the way representation is a tool or a key concept in cultural studies. Rather, representations are constitutive of the meaning of which they purport to stand in for. In the sense, now you will realize that the, represent, the represented, more than the represented object, the representation, okay, the object that represents is given more importance. Look at this again, representations are constitutive, they are not reflective of the meaning. They are constitutive of the meaning of that which they purport to stand in for. That is why we need to look, it is important when the represented uh, object is not important, the representation is important, then we need to look at what that representation is doing, what ideology go is behind uh, you know that particular representation which is constitutive of the meaning, it is not simply reflective. Then he says in the last paragraph that is representation does not involve correspondence between signs and objects. There is no direct correspondence, there is no uh, you know unmediated correspondence, there is no so to speak an innocent correspondence okay, between the object uh, that uh, you know uh, that is represented and the representation that stands in so to speak for that object. So, Barker says that is representation does not involve correspondence between signs and objects, but creates the representational effect of realism. So, representation here is understood or it is uh, you know uh, evaluated more in terms of the effect that is created by such symbolism, the effect that is created by such standing in for. Okay? So, we realize by now that we have already moved in with the help of Chris Barker from 
uh, from the dictionary meaning of representation as something that uh, you know stands in for something and is reflective of something. Okay. What are the important words here? The important words here are uh, you know are that they are constitutive, constitutive of the meaning of which they purport to stand for representational effect that it is the effect of the representation that is more important than the object. Okay. Now, if you look at it in a schematic way in this slide, signifying practices okay, are acts of symbolism, are acts of representation, okay, which are supposed to mirror, they are supposed to mirror reality. Okay. The problem here is this in the very act of mirroring or, or uh, in this very my so called mimetic act, there are several factors that come in which have to do with ideology, which have to do with power, which have to do with politics, as long as we are studying this under the domain of cultural studies. Okay. And importantly, as, so as, as is shown here in this slide, okay, there is a non correspondence. Okay. We have already sort of delinked it from the object being represented, and there we are going to study the representational effect. Therefore, representation, we see in this slide, representation have to do with not just material objects. Okay. Representation is not simply a matter of representing material objects, it is important that representation is also a social practice. Okay. Representation is a social practice and meaning and intelligibility okay, of whether material objects or mental objects, okay, meaning and intelligibility are tied down to social practices. Now, for the purposes of this slide, what, what can you can you name the term that we can use for social practices? The term that we can use for social practices in this case is therefore, ideology. Okay. Now, if you look at this slide here, it, it is ideology that is behind representation, which ultimately gives us the meaning and intelligibility of any phenomenon. Okay. Now, uh, again as uh, Barker had said, the meaning and intelligibility are not, uh, you know, are not, are not separate, are not separate from what they purport to, to tell us or to represent to us. At the same time, they are constitutive of them. Therefore, representation like ideology is a map of meaning. Okay? Now, the, the important thing to, to understand here is that representation is not only a map of meaning in this we, are, we, we understood a ma, you know maps of meaning um, what these mean in our lecture on ideology. They are a like ideology maps of meaning, but importantly they also the representations also constitute that map. Okay. Uh, there is a subtle difference between ideology as maps of meaning and representation as maps of meaning in the sense that there is a second element here okay, like ideology representations are maps of meaning and secondly representation also constitutes that map. Why? Because in this case we are interested not in the object that is represented, we are interested in what con in the fact that the representation itself is constitutive of or constitutes that map. So much so that we can even say even cultural studies representation is all. Okay? The real object so to speak remains uh, you know sort of left behind okay? and it is a rep that is why representation is so loaded with ideology okay? that it is important for us to unravel or you know uncover all that goes into the building of the representation itself that all all that inheres in creating a representation effect why because after all we deal with representations okay after all we don't deal with objects uh, in a direct uh, you know in a direct um, uh, reference all the time right when something when we for instance when we speak about something we are already uh, you know undertaking the process of representing something. You speak about anything, you speak about any person, any critic, any scientist and his works. We are the moment we use language, we are 
already creating it, recreating it, representing it for our purposes and for the purposes of our audience. And that is why this, the, you know, to study representation is immensely important. Then again, uh, let's look at what uh, Barker says here. Thus, the investigation of culture has often been regarded as virtually interchangeable with the exploration of what he calls here the processes of representation. Look at this sentence again. The investigation of culture ultimately means the investigation of the processes of representation. Such is the importance of representation in cultural studies. Further, while culture is not just a matter of representations, but also of practices and spatial arrangements. Now, this word spatial, you know, is to do with space. We distinguish it from the word special, S-P-E, okay. The word uh, also of practices and spatial arrangements. It can nevertheless be argued that it is the process of representation that makes practices meaningful and significant to us. Now, what Barker is saying here is that, well, I agree, we agree that culture is not just, it is not just representations or representation effects. We agree that culture is also a matter of different uh, cultural practices and different arrangements in both in space actually, both in space and time. But he says that we can very well argue that the process of representation, the process of symbolization, okay, is that which makes practices meaningful and significant to us. These last two words I think are very important, okay? meaningful and significant. How uh, do we acquire, how do we take out meaning from those very practices and spatial arrangements that he is talking about here? It is only through the process of representation. The significance of things, the meaning of things, the value of things is available to us not by the object per se, but as it is mediated through a process of representation. So, representation is intrinsically bound up with questions of power through the process of selection and organization. So, obviously, if you have to represent something, you cannot talk about everything about that object or that cultural event or that uh, phenomenon, uh, even it be, be it a scientific phenomenon, okay? you would have to be selective and you would have to organize it in a certain way. Now, the whole process of selection and organization is seminal to the representation process, okay? since as we have already said, we cannot talk about everything uh, regarding a certain object or phenomenon. And secondly, we have to organize it in such a way that it seems intelligible to people. This is what we talked about just a while ago, okay? making things intelligible, making things significant, making things meaningful and even making things have value for us. Okay? So, representation is therefore bound up with questions of power. Now, power is, uh, you know, related to the way we select and, organ, uh, and organize things. Now, here it does not mean that um, uh, you know you are you every time you select and organize phenomena that you are always thinking that it is giving me power and it is an act of power on my part. This the word power here is used more in the Foucauldian sense of power the you know the, the ever presence of power in, uh, in society. Okay? So, you uh, when we select and organize we already have an ideology okay, that propels us to select most of the time to propels us to select and organize things in a bid to represent those things. So, the power of representation lies in its enabling some kinds of knowing or some kinds of knowledge to exist while excluding other ways of seeing. This is most important. Okay? The moment, it is quite obvious really, the moment you select something and the moment you leave out other aspects of it, the moment you organize things in a certain way, you are already engaging in a process of inclusion and exclusion. Therefore, representation as power is both inclusive and exclusive. This is important to keep uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, to keep in mind why? Because it is power that, or ideology that's going to, to, to sort of determine what is included and what is excluded.
So, representation is also synonymous in this sense with power and ideology. So, as I said the next uh, you know critic that I am going to uh, whose, whose words I am going to use and then I am going to explain them okay, texts I am using is from his um, book entitled Critical and Cultural Theory. So, it is a very useful book because it talks about you know uh, all the chapters are devoted to different concepts okay? and I am basing my lecture part, you know of this part of this lecture uh, on Danny Cavallero's words. Now, uh, this is what Cavallero says, today many important developments in critical and cultural theory are associated with what he calls a crisis in representation. He says that it is not only representation, uh, analyzing representation, looking at the various aspects of representation that are that are important in cultural studies. Today, currently, he says there is a crisis in representation. There is a crisis in our in our understanding in the sense that there are ways in which, as we can use this word, representation has been problematized further. Okay. Now, the moment we come away from uh, you know from the dictionary definition of representation what we have done is we have already problematized it but cavallero seems to think here that there is a further problem problematization uh, in and he calls this a crisis in the in the humanities as far as uh, representation goes now uh, uh, how, how does it happen now let's read from cavallero's text that the study of representation must take into account a wide variety of cultural phenomena. We need, need to understand in the first place that, that the study of representation should take into account the variety of cultural phenomena, philosophical perspectives and ideological programs. Uh, we have human beings operating in disparate cultural and historical contexts and we have felt the need to represent themselves and their environments. Why do certain cultures openly admit to the constructed and fictional status of their representation and others seek to pass them off as natural and real? He says that there are cultures which openly, which readily admit uh, you know, uh, the fact that their representations are fictions, that representations are, are constructed and they even celebrate the fact okay, that these are constructions. But he asks this question, why in, but in, in other cases, why are, uh, you know, these, uh, why are there also cultures which seek to pass their representations off as what we call natural and real, being as close to uh, reality or the, you know, the real object, to, so to speak, uh, to be, uh, to use the word faithful to the original. Okay? So, there is we need to also investigate why some cultures celebrate uh, the fictionality of the representations and why other cultures hang on to them okay? uh, as if they were the faithful copies of the original. Second question he asks here, why do different forms of representation, sorry, what do different forms of representation tell us about the societies, communities and individuals that produce them? Okay? So, representations have different forms, okay? the way I represent something, the way you represent something, for instance, the way, simply, simply put, the way man is represented in uh, you know, in cultural studies, in sociology, in anthropology, in literature, okay, uh, it is different from the way man is represented in biology. Okay, biology would would refer to man as Homo sapiens, but in in other in literature, for instance, we would look at um, in most cases the inner life of man, his passions, his feelings, his moral dilemmas, etc. Okay, so he asks, what do different forms of representation tell us about the societies and the communities that produce them. This is something that is needed to be investigated. Okay? Who are representations addressed to or aimed at? This is the third important question. Okay? Um, what was the first question? Why is there, you know, uh, why, is it, why is it a fact that some cultures openly say, openly celebrate the fictionality 
uh, the constructedness of the representations where others take great pains or uh, you know go to go to great lengths to assert that their representations are closest uh, you know to the to the original. Second question was these different forms of representation belonging to different societies, uh, communities or even knowledge domain, domains like I said the literature on the one literature on the one hand and on the other hand as I said uh, 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 biology in, 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 in uh, you know representing what man is. Okay? So, why do these different domains, different cultures have different forms of representation? Point number 3 this question he asks is who are, who are representations addressed to and aimed at? We need to look at these very carefully. This is what he calls a, there is a crisis in representation in the sense that we need to, um, need to uh, you know further the problematization of the word representation. Then look at this is what he says and I am quoting from Danny Cavallaro, a representation only represents by virtue of being interpreted and ultimately represents anything it is capable of representing. That is it has an indefinite number of potential as it says potential representational context. Okay? Uh, here representation is tied to this word interpretation. A representation only represents by virtue of being interpreted and uh, we have to keep in mind that there are myriad ways of interpretations okay? and the way things are interpreted is tied to the way a thing is represented. And then he says we have to admit the fact that there is you know there is an indefinite number of potential represent, uh, representational contents. The, even as we look, study, analyze and eventually accept or consume one representation, it is important to keep in mind that there are immense, there is an immense number of or as it says an indefinite number of potential representational contents. For every so to speak official representation of something, there are other potential representational contents that uh, in terms of cultural studies because of ideology, because of power do not see the light of day. Second he says the concept of representation is also intimately connected to that of repetition. On the, the first case we had interpretation and the second case we have repetition. Okay? How is re repetition important for representation? When a representation is repeated over and over in a cultural setup. Okay. It in sort of instantiates itself as the dominant representation. Just a while ago we spoke of several potential, okay. there are potential representational contents of which only one or two make it as a dominant representation or representation effect. And these dominant representations or representational effects, uh, they establish themselves in the cultural order through a process of repetition. Because if it is not repeated, then then it does not enter the cultural realm in uh, you know uh, um, uh, in a in a in an established sort of way. Then he says it could be argued that words, for example, are representations which only acquire meaning to the extent that they may be repeated, namely used again in different contexts. Now we. We had, uh, you know, if you remember, we we had this lecture, we did we had a discussion on structuralism, okay, and wherein we said the language or words are a matter of convention, right? Words have to be used. Have we have to, you know, we have to submit to the convention called the language system, and uh, that is how you know words which are which are essentially arbitrary in nature, okay, begin to have what we call social. Uh, currency or communication currency. Okay? We will look at this again, it could be argued that words for example, are representations which only acquire meaning to the extent uh, that they may, may be repeated namely use again in different contexts. Imagine if you coined the word today, okay, which is very possible, we have neologisms or new words been added to the dictionaries all the time. Now, if such a word was coined by you, and it was used only once or only twice maybe by you 
okay and and not by anyone else what happens is the word this neologism or this new word dies down okay it dies away because it has not gone through or not been through this important process called repetition and particularly where different people use it in different contexts okay so like words uh, words which are ultimately representations are ultimately symbol. What is the word tree for instance? The word tree is a representation or a symbol for the uh, uh, you know for the um, for the object tree. Now, there is nothing tree-ish as we recall we had discussed in our lecture on structuralism. There is nothing tree-ish in a tree. Okay? There is nothing tree in the tree so that it calls out to say that look I am ontologically or essentially a tree. How is this proven? This is proven by the fact that there are different words in different linguistic systems, different cultures uh, you know to represent the object tree. Okay? So, the point Cavalier is making here I feel is that words are also representations okay? and, on the, on, you can also say uh, you know or the reverse or the inverse that uh, representations may cultural representations may also be seen as words and languages. Then we come to uh, the philosophical aspect of what uh, Cavalier is saying and I am quoting again from uh, his text. The world cannot be represented accurately and objectively for the reason that it is not a given, but rather an effect of how it is perceived from various viewpoints. Now, you will recall um, in one of my lectures I discussed, you know, talked about epistemology. Okay, or the theory of knowledge and also uh, you know the suggestion given by several philosophers that um, there is a reality and we represent the reality to us, to ourselves, to our fellow men using the cognitive structures, using the you know the hardware so to speak and software of our, of our brains, the brain and the mind and we represent them according to the way we are sort of allowed to see reality through our cognitive uh, cognitive apparatuses. So, this sentence by Cavallaro uh, takes on uh, a philosophical dimension as I have said the world cannot be represented accurately and objectively there is nothing called objectivity the world even if it is represented through science has a certain amount of subjectivity in it for the reason that it is not a given the world for us is never a given, but the world is a representational effect. Okay. Reality is a representational effect. Look at the profundity of what is being suggested here that we cannot have access to reality as it is, at least not wholly. Yes, science does give us you know a picture, a sort of a true picture uh, in the sense that science works and you can replicate experiments, you can you can reestablish the veracity uh, you know of certain scientific facts. But in a philosophical sense, then reality is an effect. Okay, uh, of how it is perceived from various view, uh, viewpoints. Secondly, much as he says, much recent criticism has claimed that the real as such is unattainable. We only experience it through the mediation of text, images, and stories. Now, look at the, look at look at uh, this very important point. Okay, uh, the real is unattainable. Okay, and accept this is an acceptance of the fact that we cannot attain a whole you know a holistic so to speak um, a knowledge about reality and that the mediation here is done through things like text, images and stories. And after all what is a text, what is an image and what is a story? You are right the answer is representation. Okay? Even a scientific text may be called from a humanities or perspective from a philosophical perspective a representational text. So, reality comes through us again we find the importance of the term representation mediated. Okay? Reality is available to us uh, through a mediation of certain representational effects which come to us in representational forms. What are these representational forms? These representational forms are what we find here in Cavallaro's words. These are the text the images and stories that we construct. Remember text, images and stories are maps of meaning okay? and according uh, to Stuart Hall they are not just maps of meaning, they are constitutive of that meaning. Okay? So, 
it seems that text, images and stories that all that we can ever have okay, in the sense mediated reality through representation is all that we can have. The picture is not so pessimistic as it may seem. Okay. The point is uh, you know to a large extent these representations work particularly in science. Where we have to be very careful is, is in terms of the social and political uh, and cultural realm, okay, where text, images and stories and remember Rola Bath talking about ideology, okay, myths, uh, these sometimes are circulated in such a way that they seem to be quote unquote natural for us, they seem to be given for us. This is where we have to be very, very careful. And I think Cavallaro rightly terms this as a crisis in representation. The crisis per, you know, particularly is uh, you know a philosophical one when we realize that we cannot have an unmediated access to reality and that reality is available to us only as representational effects. Then he says what about these stories, these texts that we have been talking about. Now I am quoting him again these stories and texts these never mirror reality you know we have already we have long you know left behind the, the that mimetic uh, you know school of thought these never mirror reality transparently and neutrally but actually represented according to the codes and are accordingly naturalized that is their status as constructs is effaced the important thing to note here is that you may think that these mirror reality but actually it is you know it is according to certain codes codes of what codes of both you know, remember the two words selecting and organizing, the two words that we had occasion to talk about a couple of slides ago. Okay. There are codes, there are norms, there are rules as to how you may select and how you may organize things. Okay. So, reality is represented according to those codes okay, that are that through which things are naturalized. So, uh, you know, when we accept the thing as real, we are accepting the representation. It is very important to note we are in a philosophical sense accepting the representation, we are learning the codes by which the selection has been done, the organization organizing has been done, we are learning the codes through which we can unpack and understand such selection and organization. Okay. And what happens as a result of these you know the process of repetition or as the result of you know submitting to this encoding and decoding what happens is look at this word here the status of these representational forms as constructs is effaced or erased or removed okay we forget right we forget that these things are simply here is the word that these things are simply constructs right through repetition there is naturalization and the representation therefore stands real literally stands for or is the object itself. Okay. Then representations are a vital means of supporting a culture's ideology. Now again we come full circle here okay, back to ideology. Right? So, these representations, these texts, these stories, these images as I have just said begin to stand for the real thing and are you know uh, real to us and are circul these things that are circulated in a community, in a culture, in a society, okay, they support a culture's ideology. The world view, remember we talked about ideology as a world view and I am reading this again, representations are a vital means of supporting a culture's ideology, the world view invented by that culture to legitimate itself and to discipline its subjects. I think these last two words are immensely important. Okay. A we know by now that representation is deeply tied down to ideology, in fact it is a vehicle of ideology. Okay. True circulation and constant repetition it becomes a career or, or a, a vehicle of of ideology and as we learnt in the last two lectures every ideology okay, is a world view, it is a way of looking at the world, uh, you know these are lenses through which you view the world and the world view invented by that culture right, it is also a vehicle, representations are a vehicle of a particular culture's dominant ideology. Let us not use the word ideology just as it is because they are ideologies, we are talking about a culture's dominant ideology. Now what happens? 
is when representation becomes a vehicle of ideology. Okay, um, it tries, it ends, you know, or rather, it tries to, or it ends up um, legitimizing that very dominant ideology. It ends up legitimizing uh, that very culture to, to, to sometimes even show that this is the best way things can be selected and organized. Okay, to legitimate itself and importantly to discipline its subjects. Okay, because if you have to learn the codes of both encoding and decoding um, culture of encoding and decoding culture through representations and representational effects, okay, you are already disciplined into it. Now, the word disciplining has you know in this sense several nuances is you enter a discipline you know. So, for instance, when you do the sciences you have to talk in a certain way okay, you, have to, you have to use a certain discourse. When you are in another setup in a religious setup for instance, you are not talking about man as a biological being all the while you are talking of man in a different way. So, different you know representations are uh, kind of uh, again let us use Althusser's term okay, interpolate or hail or beckon call out to you to discipline yourselves. Okay? So, in the sense discipline here also means as in giving into being a sort of a good cultural person okay? in uh, adhering to the representations of the dominant culture. Okay? I think here Cavalera has several very important things to say both in terms of a philosophical understanding of representation and in terms of a cultural political way, uh, way of looking at representation effects that legitimize a culture's dominant ideology and also discipline its subjects into accepting that ideology. Further, he says, thus the central concern of any critical assessment of representations should consist of de Now, what is our job therefore, is not just to submit ourselves, to discipline ourselves and to add to the legitimization of culture. He says, the central concern, we have to critically assess these representations and representational effects. The central concern of any critical assessment of representation therefore, should consist of denaturalizing. Okay? It, these have been naturalized through what? If you recall, these have been naturalized through constant repetition and circulation in the culture and, it, and we should uh, denaturalize these. Not denaturalizing what? As I said, look at this slide here, please. Both the cultural images and the institutionalized responses to such images that surround us at all times. Okay? We have to sort of lay bare, right? We have to decode the codes themselves. Okay? We have to decode the process that goes into the making of of the naturalization of such representations and we should denaturalize what? Both the image that has uh, uh, that represents the you know the phenomenon and secondly also uh, the institutionalized responses you know our responses to the uh, uh, to the images, to the pictures, to the stories that circulate as the dominant uh, representations are also institutionalized in the sense that we are uh, we are uh, even indoctrinated into decoding them. Why? Because we have learned the codes as per, as cultural people. Okay. So these surround us as, as at all time, and it is cultural studies as a discipline, okay, which or as a domain of study, which trains us to be careful about representations, which trains us not to consume the images and stories which stand as the dominant representations, and which also teach us to be wary of the fact that we are our responses are learned responses, our responses are learned through a process of institutionalization even, even, um, uh, uh, even indoctrination into the way we should respond. That is the way we respond, the way we look at, the way we study and finally, the way we accept and imbibe any representational effect has to be critically analyzed and critically assessed. Next, this entails questioning many of the concepts and symbols which we are generally invited to take for granted as timeless, objective and a matter of common sense. Okay? Uh, there should be a process of questioning these symbols, 
questioning the concepts and we are invited look at the word invited it is like again Althusser's term interpolation and we think that or other ideology tells us that these representations are for all time to come they are timeless they are objective and they are a matter of common sense. So, all these three words timelessness objectivity and common sense are things that are not accepted as they are in in cultural studies everything nothing is timeless ok nothing has a pure absolute uh, objectivity and common sense is not common is not sensible or does not make sense all the time particularly across cultures ok it is only ideology that uh, calls out to us to accept these as timeless and objective. Therefore, any cultural product can be approached as a form of representation offering look at this vital clues to a culture's belief system. Therefore, if you have to study any culture, if you have to critically assess a culture including your own, you need to uh, uh, you know you need to look at any of its cultural products. Why? Because any cultural product is after all a representation ok, be it you know any sort of a text is really a representation of uh, uh, of what exists. Now, if you if you keep in mind that any cultural product is really a, a representation, it will tell you a lot about the, uh, the culture where it comes from, particularly the beliefs, the axioms, the postulates that the cultures take for granted as timeless, take for granted as uh, an objective account of reality or even as common sense. Okay? It gives us an idea of its interpretations of reality uh, and its way the way in which it, is, it translates both factual and, fictu and fictional situations into images. Uh, there is a lot uh, that remains to be discussed and as I, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, uh, we will take these up in the next lecture on part 2 of representation. Uh, Let us now quickly look at what we have um, discussed so far in the form of questions that may uh, be put to you in the exams. For instance, if you are given a question like this delineate the scope of the term representation from a dictionary point of view, you would say the representation uh, may mean an act, a state or fact of representing of being represented. It may be a mental image, it is may be a presentation of uh, you know uh, of a view of facts or arguments, it could mean a petition and it could also mean a body of representatives. Now, the scope when if you are asked the scope uh, you know of representation in cultural studies, you need to also bring in the rest of what we have discussed. For instance, you would say that representation obviously means all these things that I have talked about, but in cultural studies the scope of representation is enlarged to bring in the political, to bring in uh, you know the, the term representational effect, to, to tie it to terms like ideology okay, and power. Now, the next question describe the concept of representation as articulated by Chris Barker and then you would say you, will, uh, you know you would uh, uh, put emphasis on certain words in Barker. For instance, Barker says that representations are sets of processes by which signifying practices stand for ok. There is, a, there is an act of symbolism, there is an act of symbolism here things stand for things ok. And then in uh, uh, secondly when he says for cultural studies representation is not simply reflectionism ok, that they are constitutive of the very meanings that they stand in for the two words they are maps of meanings and they are also constitutive of meanings. Then representation does not involve a clear correspondence between signs and objects, but this is a term representational this is what you have to uh, bring to the notice of the examiner that there is a representational effect which stands for and becomes more uh, sort of real than the than the real object. Second, thirdly where does the power of representation lie? We would say that the power of representation lies in the fact that we select and organize things according to the ideology of the culture in which we live. So, the power of representation enables you know in a Foucauldian sort of way some kinds of knowledge to exist while excluding ok. So, inclusion and exclusion are part of it and selection and organization is what gives power to the representation.
then why do we say after Danny Cavallaro that there has been a crisis in representation studies? Okay, we will say this that according to Danny Cavallaro, uh, we realize that uh, as a recent criticism has shown us that reality as such is unattainable and this is what brings in from a philosophical point of view the crisis in representation that we experience representation only through mediation of representation that is mediation or we sorry we understand reality only through the mediation of text images and stories and that text images and stories in themselves are are representations and they are they seem to be more real at least and you can add this point that it is culture and the ideology of a particular culture that naturalizes seeks to naturalize these things and make us learn the codes okay through which we are uh, our responses are institutionalized and we are disciplined so to speak as subjects into being uh, a part of such representational effects okay so we stop here now and um, uh, there is of course a lot more to be said about representation and some of those things which uh, we would be then covering in um, the next lecture which would be part 2 of um, representation. Thank you.